in 46 uh, now so we yeah. can dive deep in to yeah. the pool yeah uh, so you know binakshi uh, do you know that we were talking to each other after 47 years and we talked non stop for 7 <laughs> minutes after that <laughs> and we laughed so much yeah. it was lovely so good to reconnect my god you've counted the years yeah i'm feeling old but actually i'm feeling young <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me <laughs> you know uh, cinema is is always been uh you know metaphorically a slice of life it is also from the perspective of the matrix really a kind of you know the other and maya. just maya and the other <laughs> part of that and you have been really a student of this maya for a long time yeah. and, uh, yeah, so is, how have how did you stumble upon this whole piece of film critiquing and you know what's the back story how where did it all begin it's my whole life not just film but my whole life has just been a series of happy accidents i don't think there's any other way to describe it um so i've never really been ambitious in terms of having a big plan for my life like what i studied in college or which college i went to i was just kind of bumbling along and i just think there's just been lots of very kind people and lots of guardian lots of guardian angels in the heavens above who kind of really nurtured me along i would say and to whom i'm utterly grateful um so i was just like everybody else so i study like of all ghastly subjects economics at college uh and so unambitious i thought um uh, i thought i didn't know what i would do studying any of the other subjects which are really interesting like english or psychology or political science or whatever i thought i'd have to end up like a as a prof and i wasn't sure i was dying to be that as a career i thought there might be other things and then i so by eliminating the others i took eco it wasn't by choice uh and then i was so unambitious i thought if nothing else works out i'll be a you know a clerk in a bank at least you know with a degree in eco and thank god my life never came to that i never had to step inside the wrong counter <laughs> in a bank but um uh so uh we we had a we had someone do a workshop a journalism workshop when we were in college in st javier's in bombay and um so i was very taken up by that and i decided to um uh to become a journalist later and uh, so i kind of you know one thing just came, so we used to do lots of this so this was one of the lovely things about zaviers you had all kinds nobody goes to zaviers to study at least i didn't if you're doing arts let's say okay so you're just going for all the other majja right there's fantastic theater there's music there's hiking there's Oh god 100 things i was in the choir i used to go hiking i would play badminton i would do hundreds of things there was a western classical music there was an uh, indian music group uh there was basketball there was just like so you went for all the other fun stuff at least i did and um so uh so i attended a class a workshop on western classical music appreciation and right after that was a journalism appreci- like a journalism workshop and i just discovered i think this was a really fun thing to do So quite soon after that, I became a journalist. Uh, again, drifting away either or there, and then at some point, I landed up in the Times of India, where I worked for nearly 15 years. So that's this is now approximately more than 30 years as a journalist. And uh, so I was never, I was never hired to be a film critic ever in my life, never ever. So I've always been a journalist. So I was doing. Um, so in the Times of India, I had my own column on Sundays. I would do features. I would do interviews. I would do reports. I would do write these pompous editorials. I'm not sure anyone ever read them. I barely read them myself. You know, pompous stuff about you know what should the French government be doing on foreign policy about oil or some shit like that, or I don't know, Indo-US relations or some utterly pompous thing which I knew nothing about. So I just had to read up desperately and just sound really important and use pompous words that sounded editorially <laughs> and basically lots of hot air. I think a lot of them are generally hot air. and they technically safe because there's no bylines so nobody knows who's written them so it's like <laughs> <laughs> ultimate license for mischief uh unfortunately i never misused it but there was scope let's say uh and then alongside then there was this wonderful you know the mumbai international film festival that used to take place also took place then and it has really a long history so uh, uh so they had a number of cinemas 
I mean, I think this, the, the cinemas I saw them at already dates me immediately. So the Mumbai festival in those days would be at uh, New Empire, New Excelsior, uh, you know, all these cinemas, uh, I think Sterling maybe, all these cinemas in town because they were very close to St. Xavier's in Bombay. And you just had to hop across five minutes and you could quickly dash back if you had to come back to work, right? So you could, if, if someone covered for you, you could even sneak there during office hours and say, oh, I was at work or I went out on a story, see a movie and come back. Um, and some of these movies, a lot of the movies were just fantastic. And I thought, what? We're making all this fantastic stuff and nobody knows. And I felt very guilty because I'm a journalist, right? I'm working in the number one paper of India and nobody the hell knows these fantastic movies are being made from all over India and so many languages, there are a lot of foreign films. In those days, and this again dates me, this doesn't carbon date me, it's theater, it theater dates me. Uh, in, there used to be, you know, the All India Radio Akashwani building in Bombay, there used to be a, a stuffy old theater called Akashwani. Okay. We used to see a lot of movies there. I remember seeing an Ingmar Bergman retrospective there, right? Unbelievable, like Wild Strawberry, Seventh Seed, masterpieces of world cinema. But there were two major influences in my life at that point. So, uh, and still are, I would say. So um, Amrit Gangar is just a fantastic, very precious mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's a film historian, a scholar, a curator, very compassionate being, just a lovely, generous man who used to run this film club called Screen Unit. Okay. Okay. This man was so extraordinary. He would actually have regular film screenings somehow raise the money, somehow have contacts, build his contacts with a lot of the consulates and show us masterpieces of Swedish cinema, American cinema, Russian cinema, French cinema. Like I remember like some dazzling movies, like um, uh, there's a fantastic Hamlet, for example, a Russian version by a brilliant director called Grigory Kozintsev. And uh, I remember now this, I would have seen this in college, but I remember the, the guy, the actor who played Hamlet was so hot. I haven't forgotten his name now. It's <laughs> Anakin T. Smoktonovsky. Oh my God. I will have a crush on him till I die. And he was such a magnificent actor. It was so extraordinarily well shot. It just makes you realize there's such a lot of masterpieces floating around on this planet and we just don't know enough about it. And what was great about Amrit is uh, the effort he would make. Because in those days, you know, nowadays films are made digitally so if they're in a dcp or you know a unit they're in a case this big as big as a cigarette case that you can put in your pocket right or uh, not even that they just kind of transmit it into the atmosphere some satellite signal yebo dcp coding shooting but in those days these guys would have these massive trunks they were like thin trunks with 35 mm celluloid reels, which were really heavy. Like you needed a whole tin trunk to show one movie. There were multiple reels. And then you had to you know, put it on that projection machine, have a double thing so that when one reel is coming to that end, the other one starts all kinds of complicated mischief going on there with the projection stuff, etc. And the effort he would make to organize all this, right? Uh, having so little resources, but just his goodwill because he was such a lovely man that all the consulates and other people and places to show, like Akashwani is not a consulate, they're not a source of films, but they would show films there because of his goodwill and his credibility, right? And he was such a darling. So he would have, the great thing was what we would get before and after the movie. So he would actually cyclo style these notes. I don't know if anyone nowadays knows what cyclo styling was. So you had to type out these things on a very special kind of paper, bang, 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 bang the keys. So it actually cut, so it was cutting what was called a stencil and the ink came on the piche card, the last sheet, like a carbon sheet in a way. And then you could make multiple copies of that. He would distribute these free before the screening and they were long and detailed notes on the film. Who's the director? What is his background? What has he done before? Why is this film special? Why is it extraordinary? Watch out for this. Look at that editing cut. And later he would, we would have Adda Baji after, which was the most precious thing of my life, right? Like to chat about a film after, over a cup of chai, wherever, the press club, either or just over any old nearest Irani joint, which is really cheap and where you could all hang out and people wouldn't bug you for, hey, what are you ordering next? So you got to leave or, you know, somebody breathing down your neck. And I think those were the richest things that I got, which really shaped me, whatever I am today, were things that I absorbed in that very 
loving atmosphere and very generous atmosphere. And the other person was Michael E. Rao, is Michael E. Rao, fantastic film critic, wow. and um, who's now, uh, who lived in Bombay for a long time and has moved to Mysore for some years. Mm -hmm. And a very extraordinary critic, her and a gentleman called Iqbal Masood. Yeah. His name was F.G. Jilani. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a critic with uh, Indian Express. Michael E. Rao used to write for many publications and till lately she's also been, been writing for, um, not gentlemen, uh, Men's, men's world, man's world, man's world, I think. But she's written for many publications in her long career. And she powerfully shaped me as a critic, both these people. Uh, Jelani Saab would often invite me. He was a member of the critic, CCI, Critics Club of India. And uh, he, he would very often invite a very large number of critics, writers, journalists, poets, academicians, historians over lunch or a chai, usually over lunch at CCI and just chat with them. And I thought, wonderful, what a wonderful way to learn something by just chatting with them over lunch, right? It wasn't a filmed interview. It wasn't uh, a question answer he prepared. But just his savagely hungry intellectual hunger to learn new things in a very civilized way. And I just thought, you know, when you look back, like one can read books. But, you know, this man was just too civilized, just, just lovely. And uh, it wasn't just me. It was just a very wide range of writing political writing, uh, historical writing, right? And he himself was a prolific author. So these two people were, these three people were very powerful in shaping my sensibilities in appreciate, as a film lover, as a film, uh, somebody who appreciates film, but that also made me a critic, I think. Because for example, when uh, Jelani Saab or Maithili Rao wrote about film, they never ever wrote only about the film per se, of course, they wrote about the film. So how, you know, they analyze the direction, the story, the acting, what is the subject. Um, uh, but they would always place it in a much deeper, powerful context. Mm. If a film was, you know, in those days, okay, Sham Benegal's films, Govind Nilani's films, um, you know, a lot of this Kumar Shani or Money Call, etc. So they were always placing the context in which the film was being made. If you were talking about, say, Ankur, so what is it saying about caste? What is it saying about gender issues? What is it saying about the status of women? So it's not just, okay, this is the story and, you know, okay, Shabana has me, oh, oh, her first role. And, you know, oh, she acted like this. Or, you know, the camera was like that, which of course are very powerful elements that make up cinema. Of course, she wrote about those. But she wrote much beyond that as well is what I'm trying to say, right? So you actually understood India and a lot of the other Indias, which we don't know and which we don't live and which we have very little idea about, like how would I sit in Bombay? I've spent my whole life in Bombay. How on earth would I know the particular details of an exploited woman in rural Andhra Pradesh, except by seeing Ankur or by reading about it or meeting someone whose story I know now, right? So it very powerfully brought these other many realities of India. It made me understand India better. And made me very proud of India with all its warts and all its horrific things. There was also so much to be proud of and so much great filmmaking. So I think these people shape me powerfully. And in another way, I would really want to acknowledge one more mentor, who is Shanta Gokhale. Wow. I think if she ever hears this, I, I doubt she'll hear this, but uh, I mean, I doubt she'll plug into this lecture, but she was a very powerful mentor. And I realized so many mentors in my life I consider mentors in a very Ekalavya sense. She, she had a cabin, like two cabins away from mine at Times of India. And she didn't actually literally hold my hand or do anything literally. But she was such a goddess just by being herself, this very simple living and very high thinking. Her intellectual breadth, the amount of books she had read, the knowledge she knew, the, the generosity with which she was willing to share and nurture very young people who were just you know, floating around with some ideas, mumbled ideas in our heads, not really knowing much about life, not knowing what we wanted to do, but just having a keenness to learn. Just in a very simple cotton handloom saris, puneri saris, uh, an absolute confidence in what she is, in who she is and what she was doing and not being cowed down by the most stylish, cool, the Malabar Hill types or the TikTok stiletto types who are, you know, la -di da and... Uh, so with it and cool and had come back from Paris and many years in America and, you know, um, had worked for five and 20 years in Paris. And um, 
being respectful of them, but not at all allowing that to affect her, right? These are all conversations in my head. I don't know what was going through her head, but she struck me very powerfully as a person, subconsciously, I think. Now I'm able to say that at that point, I had no idea. You never know what influences you. You're just living your life bumbling along. But I realized in retrospect how powerfully she had influenced me at a very, at a time that was really shaping my life and values and my career, I think. The values that came into my career. So I owe all these people very greatly. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And, and how enriched all of us are because of, you know, that sponge that you were Absolutely. at the tables. And, you know, yeah. I love the way you say Ekalavya kind of learning because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes we also realize it uh, post facto that it was Ekalavya learning, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For yeah. someone, uh, uh, you know, when, when, when was it uh, your first ever, uh, you know, role as a critic? Uh, what were you most scared of? Oh, that's very simple. Uh, so first of all, I was not the official critic, as I said. I was uh, assistant editor at Times of India. So my responsibility was to do all these pompous things. I, not pompous. So I, like I said, I, was, I had a column. I was doing reportage during the week. I definitely wrote a story every Sunday which was based mostly a feature based on an interview or a QA. and I used to write editorials. Uh, later, I used to, uh, they had a paper called The Independent, which I was arts editor for a number of years. So those were my roles, really. Uh, so this was totally like guilty pleasures, you know, like naughty pictures that like you hide in your coat. So totally my guilty pleasure. It's just the stuff that I like to do, like somebody else might like gardening or knitting or I don't know what, painting, or I don't know, growing, painting their fingernails, whatever, guilty pleasure. It had nothing to do with what my job required me to do, what I was paid to do. Uh, so the, the one thing I was really concerned about is that the film critic of the time, who was the official critic, I shan't take his name for the moment, uh, that he shouldn't be, uh, it should, I shouldn't get into his stuff. This one was very particular about that, right? Uh, he of course had his regular column. He was very, very, very famous, still is in a way. But I didn't, uh, because it was not what my big scene, right? It was just like some random piece and I very occasionally wrote about it. Right. So I was very particular because it was not a big deal to me. It was just a fun. It was totally a lark and total maja. I didn't want to get into somebody's stuff or someone to, to be concerned that I might be getting in their stuff. I didn't, was very clear. I didn't want to give those vibes out because they were not my vibes. Uh, and anyway, uh, you know, films by... Uh, Parallel, parallel cinema act uh, by what were not they didn't have well we didn't have Shah Rukh Khan then who did we have I guess Rajesh Khanna and whoever else right Vinod Khanna types um, and uh, Asha Parekh and who all now I'm really carbon dating myself so if you didn't have those guys in your films then the Times of India wasn't interested mm -hmm. right so my even when I wrote them they were buried like on page 49 under the Bombay Port Trust ad, under the ONGC ad, some corner somewhere, nobody noticed it. I was like, where, 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 where? I didn't, oh shit, I had to read a whole paper to find out where the hell they'd squeezed in my, like a fossil fuel in between carbon layers somewhere, PJ. Uh, and then I would cut it out and keep it, ah, you know, because it was like something so precious to me, which nobody knew about. So I didn't, you know, it was just my guilty pleasure. I just parked in some corner being secretly thrilled. And if I ever saw another one or some fun thing at the Mumbai festival, or films that were released, like fantastic films in Marathi, in Malayalam, in Bengali, which were released here and there, mostly at film festivals. Yeah. But nobody ever wrote about them. People only wrote about Bollywood or Hollywood. Uh, like the official critic of Times of India, but also all the other papers, only wrote about Hollywood or Bollywood. Only two Godas, right? And I'm saying, boss, what's all this other rich stuff from India that's coming out and nobody knows and nobody's writing it? As I said, I felt really guilty as a journalist. I know there is this. I love it. And I'm not writing about it, right? So I thought that would be a great disservice to this very rich industry to me, which was way superior to masala stuff. And I hugely respect Bollywood at the mainstream cinemas. I may not love all of it. I do watch it regularly. I watch loads of trash. And I think it's really important to see bad films. And I think it's very valuable to see really awful films because the worst film teaches you a lot. It definitely teaches you how not to make a film. And I think it's very, 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 very important not to, not to judge something en masse. In the sense, what I mean is, a film is a team effort of an extraordinary lot of people. Minimum five to 10, 
usually hundreds of people who are behind the scenes, right? At least there's a director, there's a cameraman, there's an editor, there are actors, there's a writer, there is a costume person, there is a zillion people, zillion, zillion people who are behind the scenes other than these sexy actors whom you're looking at on screen. And to say, cha, Bakwas film, uh, I think is uh, a lot of poverty within you that allows you to dismiss a film like that. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the time in the worst films, if you pay attention, you might discover that there's really quite remarkable cinematography or astonishingly decent cinematography, given that it's such a bakwas film, right? Or if it's a horrible film, like a horror or a thriller or whatever, you know, a wretched, wretched murder mystery, mm -hmm. there might be maybe really interesting editing going on that keeps one hooked despite really shabby acting, for example, or a really awful actor or an awful actress, right? The editing may be really interesting. Or there might be one or two songs which have, my goodness, astonishingly interesting lyrics. Mm -hmm. It's not masterpiece, but wow, I had never paid attention. And because a film is bakwas, you don't pay attention to the individual elements and you're dismissing, but you're dismissing something that, that might be, well, I wouldn't actually say flawed diamond, but I'd say maybe a basket of apples with one bad apple in it, right? Mm -hmm. And I would urge people to look at the basket rather than look at one apple or to judge the basket rather than judge one apple that has a worm, right? Uh, and I think so that's why I feel there's a lot of very valuable stuff to be learned from bad films. So I routinely see <laughs> rubbish. I, um, I usually fast forward it in 20 minutes. I love, I love, I love long distance planes because then I see loads of trash, Bollywood trash, Telugu trash, Mandu trash, like all the industries have mainstream shit, right? <laughs> and I love to see it because I really want to see it. I can't bear to go and pay money and see it in the theater and get stuck there two hours. But to zip, zap, zoom it in 20 minutes, ah, okay, I saw this. I just feel maha pavitra after that. <laughs> ah, yeah, I really enjoy it because, you know, if you ignore mainstream, I think you really a very, it's a life of poverty, I think. There's really something incredibly powerful about Bollywood and all the other mainstream industries because they're able to talk to millions and millions of people, not just in India, but all over the world. Okay, not only diaspora, but literally all over the world. And we are more recently only acknowledging audiences that are not just uh, brown, but also white or yellow or black, right? So uh, increasingly Bollywood over the last many decades has been of growing interest in China, in Hong Kong, in Korea, in Japan, in Poland. You cannot imagine how crazy, crazy people are in Poland and all kinds in Afghanistan, Iran, Egypt. Like they go completely hysterical uh, about Bollywood, right? They know a whole lot of zillions of Bollywood songs without ever knowing the meaning, etc. In Sri Lanka, I met a lovely woman who knows a million Bollywood songs that I don't know. Like I know like first two, three lines from Tachri ha 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 ha, that's it. I don't know, I'm very plugged into music. I really love music, but I don't know lyrics uh, of the whole song. I might know verse and maybe like one Ankara and like, you know, one chorus, but I'm not really big on, on I don't particularly have, you know, I'm South Indian. So I don't have an ear for all of Hindi songs because if I, if I, if I enjoy a song, I'm very passionate about it. I really need to know what these gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous Urdu lyrics mean. Yeah. And all these lovely alfas and altaf. And, you know, if I don't understand exactly what it means, it infuriates me because it's really written really with great poetry. And I need to understand what it is. And if I don't, then okay, you know, I'm okay with learning one para and knowing the song because it frustrates me, right? Because I don't know Urdu, which is such a beautiful language and so delicate and um, eloquent, right? So this is why I've kind of switched off. Uh, like, I don't know, I know zillions of Bollywood, like one para songs and one para chorus on Takshari level, but unfortunately don't know a lot of um, whole songs. And I met this really darling friend in, in Sri Lanka, Saroja Siri Vardhani, who just knows millions and millions of Bollywood songs. And this is what I love about my, the love of my life, right? Cinema and my job. Um, I just somehow very, very through some other extraordinary stroke of destiny met her. Uh, I had gone to Sri Lanka on work because I was um, like a curator of packages of Asian films at the Colombo Film Festival and somehow we reconnect. So we kind of connect after 10 years, after 10 years, after 10 years like this, after long gaps. She invited me home and she had 
zillions and zillions of these patli 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 printed song books printed song books wow of zillions of bollywood songs which she had curated okay specially curated like her darling school teacher from college is having a farewell or her 50th birthday or something she will get together a gang of her um alumni like schoolmates who are all also bollywood song lovers and th- she will curate these songs for that occasion like you know happy birthday songs from this film that film she has compiled in sinha la all these songs they don't know the meaning of any of these songs but 10 15 songs which they will all sing that evening for that teacher or somebody's birthday or somebody is recovered come back from hospital or somebody's son is getting married like she has volume i don't know anyone in india deepa do you know anyone in india who has done that anyone in india i don't know right this kind of love of bollywood you can only be humble before this power of love of bollywood right so i hugely respect it but my heart really lies with all the other with all indian cinema which bollywood is only one and um, there are 45 languages that indian cinema makes uh, india makes films in 45, 45 languages and dialects wow. and hindi is only one language wow. so if you're watching only bollywood sorry darling your poverty index is 44 44 it's appalling it's like a very high diabetes blood pressure cholesterol etc etc of your bollywood health index of your indian cinema health index yes you got to see a doctor immediately go to the cinemas immediately yeah so there's such a richness so in the course of our talk today you are going to tell us how to improve our health right and, and i will i will. <laughs> i will i will so you know um so quite somehow so uh, uh through some extraordinary happy coincidences so one year i got a, um i was awarded the national award for best film critic this was like really long back i think i don't know like 1998 something like that and uh so i was like what so all my friends were like what you know we love you and but why did you get national award and this is so interesting which tells you everything about the times of india okay where they carried my pieces i myself had to look for them look for them and i kept them in some you know cut out in my house my immediate friends sitting on my left and right in my cabins in the whole pool whom i was interacting with day and night had no clue that the own our own paper had printed anything like this mm-hmm. right because you you're kind of chosen on the basis of your writing over that one year yeah so that also tells you mainstream media attitudes to any indian cinema that's not bollywood i would request you i would actually urge you if you just google every year just look at india national awards okay every year just google it and look at every year say 2019 18 17 actually if you put india national awards google you will get the whole list for all the years you can get that right just look at the reportage of all the media they will only say oh shahrukh khan got this or you know Preeti Zinta got that or whatever or whatever. It's always a Bollywood film or a Rakesh Om Prakash Mehra or a whoever, whoever. Yeah. Even if they actually got the National Award for Best Music Director or something, the best film is a Marathi film. The best director is a Malayalam director. The best uh, actor is a Bengali actor. The best um, uh, whoever actress is a Telugu actress. But some chota mota, you know. playback singer is bollywood but that will be reported as the headlines bollywood films you know xyz is the only thing then five paragraphs on what he said or how he reacted ting 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 and best film best director in some kachra patti and sometimes very often edited out because the headlines and the main story gets only two or three paragraphs so you never actually find out who actually got the best national award for best film or best director a best actor or actress you only get bollywood reportage and if if your editor has this much this much brains you might even find out at the end of the story who actually got best film and best director so we are incredibly racist incredibly biased and we are all about one language out of 45 right so uh, i'm just very grateful that my mentors opened 
my eyes i'm very eternally grateful to the mumbai film festival that has a very long rich history that has always nurtured all these other cinemas um uh before uh when i was young and opened my eyes to all the riches of all these cinemas and um allowed me or i'm also deeply grateful to the times of india for somewhere burying my articles but carrying them i'm just very grateful because that was not my job so i've never had a i've never had a visiting card saying i'm film critic that's never been my main my main trip although my work eventually evolved so after this quite quickly after this um after the uh, national film awards suddenly my career took off on some other level so very soon after that i got invited on the jury of the khan film festival i was saying like what <laughs> like like kahan se kahan like like you like boss you know like 0 to 100 what is this you know like i was of course in full shock very grateful deeply grateful but i was also horribly 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 guilty uh, for two reasons one is um one is i really felt really bad that my mentors whom i adored had not got this award before me i was just for me it was unpardonable that i who i'm still a first level kg student in cinema i'm getting this and my mentors who have really shaped everything i know about cinema i have not got it before me so i was like i had extremely mixed feelings i was happy but a deep down it just was really troubling me a lot and i actually went to them and apologized like i apologized to maithili rao unfortunately jilani sahab had passed away by then and she said are you silly are you crazy i'm just very proud and very happy for you she said for me as well film is just one of the things i'm doing uh, she was a grandmother by then she said all my time is devoted to my grandchildren and she was going back and forth to america where her grandchildren live and she said that's what really fires me now and yes i'm also doing film but that started all bothering me and if i wanted to you know chase the national awards i could have but i it didn't really it's not something i really bother about and i have no regrets at all so please enjoy she invited me for tea and she was so kind to me so i could a little bit breathe a little easy after that she was just incredibly gracious uh so quickly after that as i said i got invited on the jury at cannes so it's something called a fipresky jury which is a french acronym for Interna federation of international a uh, jury of film critics worldwide it's very prestigious and they have juries at a lot of the top festivals worldwide including in india very uh, important body in india yeah. that also has juries and awards works for film and then i literally the next year got invited on the jury at berlin the berlin film festival and literally after that the next year on the fipreski jury of the venice film festival so tak 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 one after the other i think a lot of people wanted to scratch my eyes out <laughs> and i i was of course really i couldn't understand how these things were coming to me so quickly and unasked for and i'm just really grateful to the to the gods above what can i say so somehow that uh, so that's how i actually met the festival directors over lunch or dinner the juries would be invited or over a cocktail to you know with the festival directors and they would always say minakshi we know there's great cinema in india we've shown satyajit ray we've shown adur gopal krishnan we've shown buddha dev das gupta we just get loads of trash now we know there's good stuff but we have no idea how to find it please would you recommend to us and i said of course i will because you know anyway i was following the stuff and it was no skin of my nose because i was a journalist just doing other things like this is like you know imagine if you are one you know a just one of the hundreds of journalists in times of india and, oh my god like the cannes film festival of berlin or venice is going to select from what you recommend like oh my god like it's some other level and then very quickly i figured out that i really would like to work with the berlin film festival because they were really very good with me first of all they were willing to pay for work because if you're if you're just casually referring two or three films that you like that's one level but it's completely another ball game if you're having to look at hundreds and hundreds of indian films in all indian languages and south asia so that's india pakistan bangladesh sri lanka nepal bhutan for 22 years and then recommend them but that's a whole they knew that there is a whole lot of other serious work going on there and they were willing to pay fees so i never argue with money so <laughs> so i immediately said yes to berlin and i'm very grateful for the opportunity because that has shaped me very fundamentally and particularly to my a uh, colleague and former boss dorothy venna who has very deeply shaped me fundamentally in all my work as a critic as a curator and really fundamentally as a person as well she's been very gracious in shaping my sensibility uh, so all these people really uh, molded me to make me what i am but to come back to your 
a quick question you want to know how one one would appreciate films yeah so okay. i what's your first also, question and also the the whole repertoire in terms of language you know because you talked about the need to understand the lyrics and the why it was important yes. to understand the words yes you know how do you go past uh, you know that and and really cut through the the whole idiom of the language when you're also looking to understand oh uh, good very good question thank you for that it's very thoughtful uh, so in most of the years that i curated or program films or just love films so at the film festivals they would have english subtitles right because they were at film festivals and whatever rules there were in those days i don't know you had to maybe i think those most of the films that were at international film festivals in india did not need a censor certificate because they were films from worldwide and they were almost almost yeah they were always subtitled so you really understood and you knew how rich they were mm -hmm. and you could see the poverty of a lot of cinema that we were used to seeing and i say oh my god have you seen malayalam cinema have you seen bengali cinema have you seen marathi cinema and you're looking at bollywood and you say like am i crazy or what right if you look at the richness that's all around and you see what mainstream alone does of course there has also been a lot of very powerfully rich hindi independent cinema right but that was a very small mini almost underground stream a little pockets of you know it's not may what was called then the parallel cinema moon was never mainstream and thank god it wasn't that's why it had its own sensibility but i think the great thing was that a lot of the passing decades have brought a lot of middle what i call mindy cinema so it's mainstream indie cinema yeah. i kind of coined this term because that's really was the only way that independent cinema would survive was to have an approach towards a mainstream sensibility which a lot of films have been doing really well like for example a film like masan for example which is of course a recent film but its sensibility is powerfully indie but it has a fairly mainstream actor like vicky kaushal for example or a lovely actress like shweta tripathi or exquisite songs exquisite lyrics exquisite music which are mainstream elements and i'll give you more i'll give you more a strong example for example kapoor and sons okay. just fantastic right so it's talking about three to three generations it's talking about a highly dysfunctional indian family which goes against the entire grain of it's all about loving your families and parents and you know your relations being all mishti mishti uh, you know spectacularly coming out of the dharma stable uh, a film that talks about your parent your dad having an extramarital affair and how your mom is coping with it it's talking about one of the sons being gay and oh my god like in a mainstream film that has really really full on masala so it's got siddharth malhotra it's got alia bhat you can't get more mainstream than that it's got these really zippy dance floor burning numbers it got these chart buster songs and then it still has this indie sensibility talking about really realistic things right uh, things that a lot of families are actually coping with in india it's very very real this extraordinary skill with which you're able to combine these two this is what i call mindy and i think that ha there has been more and more of that and a lot of these mindy films have been far more successful than a lot of the bollywood mainstream ones or any mainstream industry because of their budgets being more cleverly more intelligently uh, brought about so you're really minding your cost by not having too much uh, wild expenses but uh, but actually able to recover in terms of just the size of the budget being able to recover way more and make make it profitable uh so i'm i'm very hopeful that that's that that kind of cinema will grow and more sorry i i kind of i think i tend to kind of go firki with kite flying i kind of wander from your question what what can we come back to your question no that's okay i was basically trying to understand how you get past other cinemas the, okay right so in my time mostly only at these um, film festivals you had subtitles but in all these 22 years the majority of my work mostly we did not have subtitles for a lot of films right so you actually developed a lot if you were really interested you just developed a lot of a lot of very you you just it's like it's like a child or a dog how does a child know what you're saying don't don't touch fire if you're yelling at your kid and say don't go ever touch the gas you know and you're talking to a one year old who doesn't know what you're saying whether you're speaking english or malayalam or hindi they have no clue they know exactly what you're saying a dog knows exactly what you're saying whether you speak to him in zulu or swahili or korean or polish or english or malayalam or bihari or bhojpuri right 
a dog knows exactly what you're saying. Have you ever found a dog that did not understand what you're saying? No, they don't exist. They know what you're saying. A cat, right? A one-year-old, right? You say, okay, 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 please have this dahlia. Then you get mama, you get ice cream. They know exactly they'll gobble up the bloody dahlia because you're going to give them ice cream. They know what you're saying. It doesn't matter if you're speaking Bhojpuri or Japanese, right? So it's all a question of you're being open to that. That's all. It has nothing to do with having any brains or any language ability or anything. You just have to be open. Like, what the hell is this? Let's check it out, right? Yeah, nothing more ambitious than that. No language skills, no intellectual, any shit, zero. Just an open heart, not even an open brain, just an open heart. Hey, what is this? I've never seen a malufin. Let's check it out, right? So it's just an, in, a curiosity. And in my case, it developed into a real hunger and a savage hunger to appreciate good cinema wherever it came from. The language was secondary. Uh, the language is very rich, of course, but it wasn't my criteria for loving a film, right? So uh, most of the other cinemas that I saw were without subtitles in the old days. Uh, sometimes, so I developed a lot of non-linguistic understanding in the way that a baby or a dog or a cat understands you, right? It's going beyond words. So of course, sorry, sorry. It's more about feelings and what emotions it evokes. Exactly, exactly. But there's also a lot of clues going on if you actually pay attention. Okay. So for example, I mean like the obvious ones would be like there's a woman in in white. So in Indian culture, it would mean that she's in mourning. Or if somebody has a head shaved, a man or has a head shaved, then maybe his father or his uncle or somebody in the family has died, right? So there are zillions of other clues. Or if a woman is wearing a sindoor or is now not wearing a sindoor. Or I don't know, there's like a zillion things that indicate, uh, indicate caste, for example. That a kid would be made to sit alone or somebody's house would be outside the village, not in the village, right? Or somebody would be saying, you know, you get away from me, otherwise I'll have to have a bath and purify myself, right? So these are not language related clues, they're physical. Yeah. They're, and you're absolutely right, there are emotional cues. There are a lot, lot, lot of cues in the music. Yeah. Indian cinema is full of music and actually very few of our filmmakers have learned to make films well without music telling you what to think right we are, our music is very illustrative uh -huh. if there is a sad scene if somebody's uh, brother has died oh we are assuming oh the audience doesn't know they're supposed to be sad yeah yeah let's put 21 and bang, 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 you know like let's tell them please be sad so indian cinema a lot of our cinema is doesn't trust the audience's intelligence we are some nitwits sitting in the front bench. The audience is in our heads. The filmmaker's heads, not you and me. Meaning it's not the filmmaker himself. Got it. Right? I'm assuming a filmmaker is also a film lover and he or she also watches other movies, right? So why would he make rub rubbish? Assuming, by which I mean assuming that the audience is not intelligent as he is. Mm -hmm. Right? A lot of filmmakers have never been to film school. Masterpieces, great filmmakers have never been to film school. They were architects like last year, they were software engineers last year, or they were, I don't know, farmers last year. And they're making really interesting films and sometimes fantastic films. So they have not learned how to make cinema or intellectual stuff, right? So I think this openness is all that you need. So in a lot of the decades I learned, so my cinematic sensibility is very evolved only from my heart being open to watching it. But I also tended to get, because I was in programming for Berlin, I also, and I have programmed for a whole lot of, a whole lot of festivals um, worldwide, including for the Toronto Film Festivals. Uh, they have something called Bell Lightbox, which is their year round for the Busan Festival, for uh, Locarno, uh, for the Colombo Festival, for Kerala, for Mumbai. So I programmed a lot of film packages for the BFI, British Film Institute in London. I did a year long, a whole year long program of Indian and South Asian films, which were showed over a year, like nearly 40 films, like five or six packages throughout the year. So all of these films are in different languages. And uh, because of my work, I tended to get more films, which later, because they wanted an international cut, so they would send films with subtitles. Uh, but usually such rubbishy subtitles, you wanted to tell them, just shut up and leave it be, like, don't, don't kill this movie. Because usually, and this is really tragic in our cinema, nobody actually, very, very, very rarely, very few people actually hire a very good 
subtitling person, right? They'll, they'll spend a lot of money and a lot of effort trying to get the best stars, the best cinematographer, best editor, best costume, screenwriter, all of that. They'll make, spend years trying to get a great team, right? And they'll throw away all of this by telling the assistant, Are yaar, your wife knows English now. Usko bol do, do din mein karna hai English subtitle. Haan, karke de do. Like they don't give a damn whether that person really knows English. And it's not a question of only knowing English. It is really to do with a cinematic sensibility. It's not to do with literally translation. That's the shabbiest kind of uh, subtitling. I'm telling you this because it's answering your question about understanding language. And it's the biggest, biggest black hole of Indian cinema is not paying, trying to find out who's the best English subtitler and paying them really good money and booking them in advance. I want you for my film because that is the only way you will sell your film to anyone who doesn't speak your language, right? Even if it's Hindi, there's no way other than unless it's a masala shit film. I mean, sorry, I take that back. Unless it's a masala film that is so broad that you really don't need subtitles because everybody from Egypt to Tokyo will understand who is the hero and who is the heroine and ye shadi kabhi nahi hoigi types and who's the villain and they understand when there's a happy ending, right? It's like Hollywood. The brushstrokes, I mean, mainstream Hollywood, the brushstrokes are so broad that everybody understands the broad story even if you don't get the dialogues, right? So I'm talking of any film in any other language, regardless of whether you're mainstream or not. So it's very critical to get a good English subtitling person. So actually, because I used to get great films that were rejected because the subtitlings were so shabby that people would start laughing at very heartbreaking moments in the film that I actually got into subtitling myself. So I've done like five or six films in Hindi and Marathi in a number of films. Like the Marathi films, one of them I did was Bal Gandharva, which is now I think on Netflix or Amazon. Um, so I've done five or six features and um, I really enjoyed because it taps into not only my very strong language skills, but I also have a real gift for Indian languages, but it's a cinematic sensibility that is really important. So that, that translates non-linguistic information that the, that the director is giving you, but somebody who is not Maharashtrian, for example, might not get it. Minakshi, when you say a good film, a really good film, and you say that a, a lot with a lot of passion, so what would be the ingredients that would go to, you know, make this a good film? Something extraordinary? Uh, very hard to put it in words, uh, simply because we're not talking of a great brick or a great I don't know, piece of machinery, it's art, right? So it's very volatile, it's very, it's artistic. So no one product can be replicated, right? So you cannot ever compare literally one film to another because they are two completely different things made with different sensibilities. So it's very hard to compare, but we've learned a way to compare them so that we are able to guide people about good films or not. Um, it's really very hard. I would say, I would say a story that's very convincing, that's very moving, uh, that's well written, that's well, well, well acted. Uh, it's hard actually to, to put it into words. But I would say it's a story that stays with you. It's a story that's hard to forget. It's a story that's telling you, it's a film that's telling you something very fresh that you didn't know, even if it's one more love story of which we've seen at least 800 million every year of our lives, you've seen something like that. And yet somebody's able to tell you a love story that's really fresh and think, oh, how interesting is that? Wow, you know. And that, to get a wow out of you is very, very, very tough. Yeah, I don't mean me, I just mean the audience. Yeah. So it's that kind of thing, telling you something very original, surprising you, um, or very political and daring, or need not even be political, telling you something very daring about our society, which is rarely acknowledged before. Even in a mainstream film, like say fantastic mainstream film, like a lot of Anubhav Sinha's work, like, Article, you know, Article 15 or Thappad or Mulk, you know, these are things that people don't talk about anymore, right? They're there in front of us, but we don't actually talk about it, right? So, and you think, wow, this man really got guts and he does a lot of research to, to get a lot of layering in that film, although it's full on mainstream with Ayushman or Ayushman Purana or, you know, Tapsi Pannu, etc. So, or Rishi Kapoor, yeah, that kind of stuff. So when you're, you know, and this, this sort of a understanding of, a, uh, you know, an evaluating a good film, uh, when you sit with fellow jurors, do you see, you know, there's a whole cultural imprint yeah, that we come with. And then you kind of, uh, 
you know, everybody is using somewhere themselves when they are also evaluating. I mean, you're, you, how objective can you be with art? Exactly. So how does it all come to a common ground, uh, you know, and, and how do jurors sort of, you know, what kind of, what happens behind the scenes when, you know, you know that this is it, but somebody else is looking at it from their framing and their worldview. Fantastic question. Thank you. These are really, really thoughtful questions, Deepa. Really love. It's a joy to, to be chatting with you. <clears throat> so I think the best jury meetings I've ever been on are the ones that have massive fights. I love it. I love it. I love it. Right. It's really, really boring when everyone agrees. And, you know, that happened once. I was on a tiny, tiny jury of a fantastic uh, film festival in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, called World Cinema Amsterdam. And we had, uh, they had booked uh, like a room, uh, a, a cafe, a very quiet thing with sending us coffee and breakfast and booked our lunch and like three, four hours meeting and booked the day for us. <laughs> we met and we just ordered coffee. And before we had finished a cup, we were saying, okay, let's go home, bye. We, we, all, we all knew we wanted this one film and we said, okay, now I'm going to whatever, to, I'm going to walk out in the town because I want to look at Amsterdam. I could literally in five minutes that we just knew everybody. It was a fantastic film uh, from Colombia called Porfirio, P-O-R-F-I-R-I-O -R -R by Alejandro Landes, which was so good. And it was like this in those days, fairly early, fairly early days, although the genre existed of this very exciting genre called docufiction, right? Where you can't tell whether something is a documentary or it's fiction. And you think, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe that's happening. Oh my God, your heart's in your mouth with what's happening to this guy on screen. And then at the end of the credits, then you say, oh, actor, so-and-so. And you think, what? what, 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 that guy was acting? Like it was an actor, you know, and, your heart, and, and you think, what, did he fool me? And you say, no, but it's also great art if this person could so completely make you believe in it for two hours, right? Or 90 minutes or whatever, right? So it's extraordinary skill. And he's a very, very gifted filmmaker. We were over our jury meeting, which is supposed to take three hours, past lunch, finished before coffee, not even breakfast. Our croissants had not even arrived. We said, okay, it's Porfirio and that's it. But uh, I really enjoy massive fights. The bigger the row, the better. Because I learned such a lot from somebody who's having completely a different take on the film and say, Oh my God, it never occurred to me to see a film that way. And that's because it can be just a, a, just a, a film critic's instinct. That's a different way of reacting to the same film, but also brings exactly what you said, a cultural history or a, how a Russian critic or a Japanese critic might react very differently to a film than I would, right? So, uh, I mean, one of the most appalling experiences, appalling was when I was on the Khan jury and I just bloody died of it. I'll never forget. So there was a very well-known film, Russian filmmaker who had a film that year. And it was really a very mediocre film. And we were really heartbroken because he's a fantastic director. But this one wasn't a great work. And he had made great work early. That's why it was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. But it was really, Ugh! and we were like cringing and thinking, boss kya ka neka? But I mean, there's no way. It was really bad film. And this Russian critic was maha cool. And she said, of course, it's a shit film, but I'm Russian, so I'm voting for it. And I said, oh my God, what? I couldn't believe you can be on the jury of a jury at Cannes, and you can be a top critic and actually say, this is a shit film, but I'm Russian and I'm voting for a film because it's Russian. I couldn't believe it. And I said, I can't believe what I'm hearing, but well, at least I would acknowledge her honesty, if nothing else. And... Um, so it also, of course, and something I was very aware of for a very long time, but there's a lot of lobbying and, you know, stuff going on. And you can never, ever control anything that is a human activity. There will always be an element of subjectivity. Uh, and subjectivity can't be quantified. You can't say, oh, but I'm 100% subjective because I said this film is bad. And she's only um, zero subjective because she's voting for a film which she's saying is bad. You can't quantify subjectivity and put it in a box and say, I'm pure subjective and she is negative subjective, right? That doesn't exist. So as long as we are human beings rating things, it will be subjective, all our sensibilities. Uh, so for example, also in a, in, a, in a different way. So other than judging, for example, 
uh, I mean, I have one of my really great favorite films is Shubhana Rekha by Ritik Bhatta. Mm -hmm. And uh, I once, I had seen it and I really loved the film. But uh, one, oh, sorry, one of the other really important things that really powerfully shaped my life was once I had a massive row with one of my bosses in journalism, I quit my paper in a fury, which I've never done because I've otherwise been very middle class and always got the next appointment letter and then quit. But this was, no, I gotta leave this place now. And then I didn't know what to do, I was just sitting at home like an idiot and then, you know, waffling through the papers. And I saw this ad for a film appreciation course at the Film Institute in Pune, and that changed my whole life. It was like 45 days of the greatest world cinema, the greatest Indian cinema, with Indian directors coming there for Q and A's, and that actually changed my whole life. So big, big credit to them. Um, but when I saw Shubhana Rekha there, it just broke my heart. I couldn't breathe. I was weeping so bitterly, so bitterly. I could not speak to anyone. So the routine was we would see two films back to back, six o'clock and I think nine o'clock, and then twelve o'clock till two in the morning. We'd all be over beer, rum stronger stuff, sitting under what is called the wisdom tree, this ancient mango tree, and then arguing about cinema, talking about cinema. Somebody would be singing classical music. Somebody would be on the guitar. So fantastic sessions till two, three, four in the morning. And after this film, uh, then we would order some biryani, shiryani, you know, people would eat right there, just very careful, but it was fab. The Adda Bhaji was the high point of the whole of Pune appreciation. But I just want, I crawled like a dog into an area called the woods behind in the property of the, I mean, Pune campus is very vast. There used to be a former swimming pool there with an ancient banyan tree deep. It was really in a very woody area, no lights there. I just went there like a dog, sick dog to weep and die. I could not bear to talk to anyone. And I think after a point, my friends started looking for me saying, where's Minakshi? I could hear them with torches that come looking for me. And I was just hiding because I didn't want to be found. I just wanted to be left alone to die. So film can move you so much that you cannot bear to talk to somebody, you know? And I had seen the film before, so it can also be that at that point in your life, something has, something has moved you so deeply. It's something you're going through at that point, which makes you vulnerable. Something that happened to your friend or in your family or something you heard. And you know, that the weight of that grief is on you and just waiting for something to explode, right? So what I'm saying is, to come back to your point about being on jury or otherwise when judging a film, it's also about where you are at that point in your life. So you can judge the same film very differently. You know, there are seven questions that the attendees have posed. Yes, please, please, please. I, I had completely, I was so mesmerized and into everything with you and oh, you know, yes. besides you and, yes. and me as I was hearing that I... Yeah. Um, so there's one question here. If not for films, what else would you have liked to write about? Write about? Mm. Oh, so I actually have a whole other parallel career to do with uh, very, very, very deep and passionate, which not a lot of other people know about because it's not sexy and glamorous. And for the last 20, 25 years, I've actually been involved in what are called developmental issues. So gender issues, women's issues, water, education, health, wildly unfashionable. And I really have to thank my national award for it. Because that was one of the other things. So as I explained, when I got the National Award, I was very delighted and very proud, but deeply, deeply uh, troubled as well. And one of the reasons was because I'm, I'm essentially my training is as a journalist. And as a journalist, you get to see a lot of, know a lot about your country and the world, which you might not otherwise if you're sitting at home and mainly looking after your family, right? I'm not, I'm never ever... I hate that phrase, only a housewife or just a housewife. I want to strangle any woman who calls herself just a housewife. It's just the most infuriating thing because you're looking after your family, damn it. And it takes a lot. But what I mean is if you're mainly only looking after your family and that's your main thing in life, you might not be exposed to the larger world as much as somebody who's already going out and meeting lots of people. And as a journalist, you meet way more people than somebody would if they're just sitting, If sorry, not just, if they are mainly having a computer job or you know, client job thing, then you meet your clients. But as a journalist, you meet just everyone from somebody who's been raped to police thana to a fire to glamorous celebrities to, you know, whatever. So, um, so you get a much deeper exposure of the world, a wider exposure of the world, I'd say. And I was always interested in, in, real, in the real India as well, which normally people are not exposed to. And I knew there was such a lot this country needs of me as a journalist and demands of journalists in general, including me. And I just thought I have to do a lot more work in that because I really enjoy that a lot more. So for the last 25 years, 
I've been doing a lot of writing and work in a lot of research work and advocacy in, um, as I said, women's issues, water, education. So I've traveled all over the country, obscure villages in Haryana, in Tamil Nadu, in Bihar. I've been in the forests of Bihar, uh, which are literally in jungles uh, with NGOs. So mostly this work has been with NGOs, um, meeting tribals who have, who live of the forest, who have not even been real part of what we call civilization in the sense that they are just harvesting, um, harvesting uh, berries, beeswax, making lac bangles, uh, honey, and they come to civilization, a weekly hut, uh, in which is the nearest village, <clears throat> to exchange it for salt and matches. They have not even, after all these years of India's independence, not even arrived at a money economy. They don't even, they've not even handled money, right? And these NGOs are working with them, getting them water, <clears throat> training them to, you know, cut your nails, wash your hands before eating because there are germs in it, you can't see, put your kids in school, let's get some kind of tiny, some source of income for the family, because it's only when they, and this, the first NGO, which I will always be grateful for that set me on this journey, is the Family Planning Association of India. They set me on this journey, uh, and they were such darlings. So they saw the boss, I can't remember her name now, she, she saw something I wrote in the Times of India, and thought that maybe I have a sensibility, because as I said, Film writing was a very tiny part of my journalism. I wrote on a range of things. She saw something I said, uh, I wrote and called me to her office and she said, you know, we would be so delighted to write so well. Would you please write on, on the, our work for us, for our newsletter or website or whatever. I mean, there were no website those days, for the newsletter. I said, immediately, don't think. She said, we can't pay you much. I said, don't pay me, I'm getting a salary. You know, she was like appalled that I, she would get a journalist from Times, I mean, who doesn't want money. But I'm saying I'm getting a full salary there and I'm getting to travel the whole country. So I've really, really seen the underbelly of what this country. So I'm very conscious. So I've also been on the board of a nonprofit called Point of View, uh, headed by Bishaka Datta. So I've done a lot of work in gender issues, water issues. Uh, so that drives me passionately. And I think I will be doing a lot more of that alongside my film work. I've always done that. But because it's not glamorous and it doesn't need me to be at Tan Berlin, Venice, you don't know about it and it doesn't have Shah Rukh Khan in the picture. But it's something that drives me very passionately. And I also teach English at a school for underprivileged kids uh, close to my house. And that's a big passion for me for the last four or five years. Yeah. In fact, uh, that whole dimension of you, the social uh, Minakshi, is <laughs> for me and for the audience, I want you all to know that there will be a separate Learning Monday, uh, which will look at that facet. You know, so I'm <laughs> Okay. A learning Monday and a learning Monday and okay. one where we need to do several yeah. but next one I promise our viewers is going to be one on Minakshi's work uh, where even if we take one aspect so you know I'd like to do a session with her which is uh, you know children and empowering children is concerned and one definitely for women and the work that you've done with the Gram Panchayats and uh, I'll be very honored <laughs> we'll be doing that so yeah. sorry I should pay attention also to the questions are there any sorry uh, please let me know if there are any so, um, I did want to talk I did ask this question very deliberately because I wanted the audience to know that there's a range to you and that's the reason I picked this question first thank uh, you and I will go back to the film question so thank yeah. you for asking uh, that question yeah uh, thank you uh, there is there is a question here which says, uh, Minakshi, if you had to name your 10 all-time favorite films, films to see before you die types, what would they be? Impossible to tell. I just see volumes, like I see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of films every year. And I've done that for more than 22 or 25 years. So there's no way in hell. I think I will take another 20 years to find out which are my 10 <laughs> favorites. So ask me when I'm like, when all my hair is white, okay? <laughs> but, but I would like to give you a little guide. So um, recently I was on a, uh, on a platform called Avid Learning where I've conducted a lot of film appreciation classes and I'd shared uh, some of my top five films with them. And these are not my great all-time favorites because it's not very useful to you to tell you my all-time favorites because if you can't see them, you'll say, oh, you know. So I've kind of tailored that to what you can actually see right now, especially since we're in Corona and a lot of people are online. So it's films that I feel very passionately about and I really love them. And you can actually see them right now on a lot of streaming platforms. So first, I would say, so my top five uh, films for now, I would say the first film is Sudani from Nigeria. Are we going to uh, see them now? Sorry? 
Are we going to see them now? I think are we going uh, to I'm going to show you a trailer, but maybe I'll tell you a little about the film and then uh, Rohan, our colleague who's been such a fantastic support, can play it. So Sudani from Nigeria is a wonderful Malayalam film playing on Netflix. It's by a very brilliant director, Zakaria Mohammed. And it's a very, very charming very funny. It's about a football manager for a very tiny ragtag football team in a tiny village in Kerala, which has a star African player, football player. And what happens when the player comes to stay with the manager when he falls ill and the friendship that develops. So it's not only, it's very finely observed for small time detail. So funny. It was just, it's just very exhilarating to be laughing a lot. And uh, it's kind of very organic humor. And I really like it because Indians are just bloody racists. We just, we just have an attitude towards uh, blacks or African Americans or uh, Northeast people or chinkies or we're just waiting for an excuse or Muslim or Dalit. We're just waiting for some label to bung onto somebody so we can treat them like shit. We are incredibly powerfully racist. And this film is very, very valuable to me. And uh, apart from being an utter joy, because it shows Muslims to be what they just are in real life, which is also incredibly compassionate and very funny and full of mischief and naughty as well, just like any of us, right? So that is my number one favorite. Okay, my number two film is, uh, so uh, Sudani is on Netflix. Then there's a film called Pariyaram Perumal. I'll spell that P-A-R-I-Y-E-R-U-M, Perumal, P-E-R-U-M-A-L. It's uh, in Tamil, it's on Amazon uh, Prime Video. It's by Marie Selvaraj and produced by Paranjit. Very powerful, um, an intercast romance. Um, and um, it's played by this very fine actor, Kadir. And um, it's it's very strong film because it's, it's about this low caste man who is determined to, uh, there are horrific atrocities against the uh, lower caste every day in India that a lot of us are unaware of. And he's very determined to fight it, not with violence, but by studying law and by having very considered conversations and dialogues with other people to sort issues and go beyond violence. Um, but he can't actually escape the incredible violence that's inflicted on him. And his, fian his girlfriend actually is a middle class, lovely woman who's a law student in his class. And she really represents you and me in the larger sense of being a middle class that is largely empathetic to the lower caste. We just feel bad for them. But we have actually no clue whatsoever about their horrific realities that they live every day and the shameful, disgusting, murderous, murderous behavior of the upper caste, which we have no clue about. So this film is a very powerful way that it shines a light on them. And uh, that's on Amazon. Uh, number three, I would say, is a wonderful, wonderful Sri Lankan film in Sinhala, Oba Nathua Oba Ekka. The English title is With You, Without You, by Prasanna Vitanage. Uh, the surname is uh, Prasanna, and his surname is V-I-T-H-A-N-A-G-E. Uh, it's in Sinhala, and I'm sure you're going to think, oh my God, this woman's really weird recommending Sinhala films. But actually, Prasanna Vitanage has been a master of world cinema for many decades. He's fretted all over the world. Only racist Indians will not see his films if they are not interested. Uh, if you're interested in great cinema, you will watch his films. Um, and this film uh, is also an Indo-Sri Lankan co-production with the lovely, uh, India's lovely actress Anjali Patil. Okay. And a very fine Sri Lankan actor, a uh, very fine actor, Sham Fernando. And it, it's again a Sinhana Tamil relationship about a man who's, um, he's, uh, what's the word? He's a pawn broker. And a woman comes to pawn her jewelry during a crisis to raise money. And then he falls in love with her and they marry. And it's much later uh, that they actually learn about each other. They don't ask too much about each other's pasts. pasts. And then they realize that he was actually in the Sri Lankan army and she was a Tamil victim of the war. Mm -hmm. And then they're kind of irreconcilable and how that relationship is torn apart because of the past, right? And uh, the tagline of the film is love is never enough. A uh, very powerful film, very delicately made. And Prasanna is a real master, is a real master of making silences eloquent, of saying a lot by saying very little. And very few Indians have that talent. Fantastic film on Amazon Prime Video. So there is a, a, a comment here. Yeah. Uh, so Parhat says, love entirely what's being spoken and how it's being spoken. But what's with being so anti-mainline Indian cinema? 
Oh, <laughs> then you weren't listening to what I said. If you think I'm anti mainline, I think you weren't listening to anything that I said for forty five minutes. Maybe she came in late. So no we, problem. So uh, I think you're going to put up the link. So anyone who thinks that I'm anti mainstream cinema, that's the reason I asked. Please take a look at what I actually said, as against what you assume I said. Yeah, yeah. It's so all I, in your head. Yeah. So people may come come in later, but it's, yeah, it's possible you didn't catch. Yeah. So please look at the link. I really respect a lot of, and I like a lot of mainstream. Yeah. But uh, my heart lies with Indies. That's true. But it's not like I hate it or anything. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, there's a lovely question here. Any film that made you go, "Damn, I wish I had written or made that." Oh man, that happens all the time. Not fair question. Not fair at all. I don't think. Um, I mean, I've directed one film, a short film, but uh, it was just like a tiny. Um, I think it was like five minutes or ten minutes. No, five, five minutes. Um, it was a film called "Looking for Amitabh." and it was like um, so you know we have this kalagora festival in in bombay every year and uh, so one year they banangal was curating the film section and he got a number of people who have never made cinema before the criteria has to be that you have never made a film before so some only people with zero experience of filmmaking were invited to make a 5 minute film on amitabh bachchan so i was thinking like i was then a film you know i was a journalist in the times of india so how would i make a film on amitabh without amitabh in it right so uh, i really struggled that I, i had to come up with something original that would that would work and i actually made the film only by interviewing blind people on what are their impressions of amitabh so it's people who have not only not seen amitabh who are blind from birth so they've not seen anything and what they make of and people who are crazy these people are crazy about him and they've never seen anything in life like like right so it's actually a love letter to amitabh through all the senses except vision uh, through smell through hearing through touch so other than that i've not actually directed but i um i've been a mentor in a number of script labs but i've not actually written a feature film script myself so i all the films that i love I wish I'd written a script. So that's a little bit. <laughs> no I one else. love the story and the the way you've done the this Amitabh, the angle that you took of the yeah. people yeah. invited. That's thank you, thank you. So, <laughs> so, so here's a here's a question I wouldn't have thought of. So I'm asking: uh, Do you experience any prejudice towards you from other non-indian critics at international film festivals sorry say that again I'm, i didn't get the question did you experience any prejudice towards you from other non-indian critics at international film festivals ever hmm not really i'm pretty much a tough nut so if there was something maybe i didn't notice it but i would actually say i would actually remember the reverse i mean i'm pretty much a tough nut in the sense that i'm very passionate about my work and i really 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 love it and i really love film so uh if somebody said something mean to me i can't even remember it meaning you know it doesn't so doesn't matter to me uh i don't remember being hurt but i do remember being a uh, very uh, extravagantly uh very gracious behavior so once i was on the jury at uh, on a netpack jury uh, at at the berlin film festival so netpack is an acronym for a uh, network for the promotion of asian films and we give an award to the best asian film it's also very prestigious at a lot of juries and i was on the netpack jury at berlin and one of the films was a gorgeous gorgeous it actually gorgeous is the wrong word very powerful and compelling film tamil film called paruthi veeran p a r u t h i v e e r a n meaning outstanding film right it's a very powerful adapt well actually it's an it's kind of a romeo juliet story but very locally rooted and it actually was uh, the film that launched this fantastic mega star karthi who's very fantastic and um, uh, so actually uh, i like i had really liked the film to begin with it's directed by amir so i had already recommended the film to berlin and they had already selected it so it my and then i was on the, in later much later invited on the jury as well but we were judging all asian films right not just indian films from whatever 70 80 countries in asia so um uh i was a little uh, uh, so paruthi veeran came up in the shortlist like out of these five we have to choose one right so i was very conscious that i'm an indian uh and this was a tamil film i really liked and 
that I had already recommended to begin with, right? So my, my preferences for the film were already known. So actually I told the other two jurors, I said, listen, I had really liked this film. I had recommended it, it got selected. I already know my views. So I would like you to suggest how we take this forward because I'm already biased in favor of it. I already like it and I, know, I'm, I would like to declare that. But, but because I'm Indian, I would like you to uh, suggest how we go forward in voting. So should I stay out of the voting or what, what do we do so that it is fair? Both of them turned right round and were outraged. And they said, how dare you say such a thing? How dare you? A, you're on this jury only because you're really respected as a critic and therefore you're invited on a very prestigious jury. So of course we trust your integrity 100%. And secondly, and equally important, what crime has the filmmaker committed to make a film in Tamil or an Indian film that you are not going to vote for it, although you love it. Now, this is ridiculous, right? I was so humbled by their absolute integrity and trust that I would vote for any of the five films that I liked at that point and not, not Paruti Viran because I liked it. And uh, you know that it came from them. And it's also my insistence on doing the right thing and being completely transparent. I said, you tell me how, how what to do. And they were in turn beyond all generosity. You know, they were outraged that I would suggest such a thing. And they really said the right thing. What is his crime that he made an Indian film or in Tamil? If, if, you, were a, if you were a Japanese critic, you would have happily aborted, right? This, by that logic, right? So how can you transfer the, why should he pay the penalty that you are Indian, you know? And I was just so delighted. So we all voted uh, anonymous, meaning like not writing who voted. And finally, Paruti Viran was picked as a, uh, as the winner. So I was just insanely delighted. So you really get lovely people as well. So, <laughs> yeah. So there is a question here, but I think you've answered it, but I'm still going to read it out. How yeah. are you actually selected for a film festival? There must be some parameters. Sorry, sorry, the question is? How are films selected for a film festival? There must be some parameters. Yeah, I've, I, yeah, you're right. I have answered this question, but just to do a quick recap. So these are, these are not sewing machines we are grading or bricks that, oh, this sewing machine is faster than that one or needs less oil. This is art, right? So it's very hard to, um, sorry, very hard to uh, be objective. Uh, it's bound to be subjective what we, the films that we choose. And I don't think there are any objective criteria beyond in a very dila way saying, oh, it should be a good film. It should be surprise. It should say something surprising that we don't know or be very daring or get great performances or very original storytelling or have in the narrative treatment, uh, even if the subject is a cliched one, like, you know, we've had a number of films on cast, for example, but the way article 15 treated the subject, you know, with a lot of layering, for example, was very intelligently done and still telling you things you already know, but it's not on the top of your brain and your recall that, Yes, this is how India is to maybe 60, 80 percent of its population, right? Because the, the middle class and the upper class have no bloody clue how the rest of India lives, right? So something that's a revelation or original or all these other criteria, but in the end, it has to be a film that stays with you, that moves you, and you want to remember it for a long time. So that's the kind of film that I would recommend, yeah. This next question, thank you, Minachi. There's another question, uh, yeah. anonymous attendee. My best friend's Czech film, Ruja, got selected for Houston Women's Film. Say, say, say this again slowly because I can't see it on the chat. I'm just listening. Say it again, please. My best friend's Czech film, Ruja, got selected for Houston Women's Film Festival. Okay. How's the culture at such film festivals? What is the what factor at such festivals? What is the what factor? What factor? What factor? I think WH80. Is there something called a wa what factor? Okay, I have to be what get into the mind of a 16 year old to find out what this phrase means. Okay. WHAAT. What? So basically the X factor or the okay. wow factor. Uh, uh, but the what factor in terms of the film or the festival? The festivals. Okay, I haven't a clue because I haven't heard of this festival till now. And there are literally, literally 5,000 or 10,000 films on the planet. There are literally 100 film festivals in India alone. And the majority of these are international film festivals, right? So there's no way I can actually know about all the festivals on the planet. This sounds like a fairly small one, 
but that need not at all reflect its quality. It may be a very high quality one. I'm fully in support of women's film festivals. I think it's, um, it's voices that we've been suppressed for a very long time, historically and over the centuries, in life, in society, in cinema, in literature, in art, in every field, in politics, in every possible field you can think of. Women have been, women have been suppressed for too long, so every initiative that encourages women's voices to, uh, to say what they want in life uh, is to be encouraged, I think. Uh, I don't know about this particular festival, but I think the more festivals, the better, frankly, because I think the, the good ones will stay and the, the weak ones, the, the poor ones will waste away. And in fact, uh, because of Corona, I actually was uh, in April, just last month, I was actually supposed to conduct at the FTI, Film, Inst Film and Television Institute in Pune, a one week long hands-on course on how to curate films for festivals. Because almost nobody uh, in India uh, actually has learned a course because there have hardly been any to curate festivals. It's almost unheard of. People have done small, occasional, sporadic workshops, but not a systematic, like you can't go out and get a degree in curating film that I'm aware of, right? People will have little workshops or pockets uh, and, and do. So mostly people are learning on the job which can make for a huge amount of trial and error. And the danger is if you just lose an audience once, if you show one bad film, a bad Malayalam film or Marathi film or Hindi film or anything, people say, kya yaar, and you're in grave danger of not getting that audience back, right? So it's very important that curators or programmers know how to select good films and how to, there's a whole other art of audience engagement and keeping them hooked to your, commitment to good cinema other than, you know, like your own stuff. So that question is very important. And I think, um, yeah, the good ones will stay. And I think the weak ones will just waste away. But that's, that's like in any field. Yeah. In fact, there are going, there are more questions. And I know we are going to have, uh, you know, just six minutes left. So we won't okay. be doing justice. But yeah. maybe we can create some other uh, forum. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'd do. be very happy to. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll find something. Uh, I do want to, uh, because we are in these times, uh, you know, and I, I read your midday article yesterday, uh, which was talking about, uh, you know, you had talk, written about Rishi Kapoor and you wrote about Irfan Khan. And this is really the last five minutes. I just want you to close by just remembering these greats who have immortalized themselves and uh, you have written to such sensitive such beautiful pieces on both of Thank them you. Um, yeah so i think uh, they are of course a huge loss to indian cinema um, in irfan's case of course a loss to world cinema i would say uh, rishi kapoor of course it was you know they are, to be they were kind of as i wrote in my column they're kind of polar opposites in the film space in the sense that Rishi Kapoor was really born into Bollywood royalty, into the first family of Bollywood cinema to the Kapoor family, the son of Raj Kapoor, grandson of Prithvi Raj Kapoor. So that family primarily has not had any, as far as I'm aware, no or minimal, if any, professional training in cinema, right? Uh, as in having gone to, maybe somebody has done some mini course or something, but primarily by being Kapoor's, they've gone into the fam, uh, into the film business um, and their parents have got them in, et cetera. So it's like four or five generations of them. And he's really, um, and it's important also to acknowledge that it's not only their genes and their birth and the opportunities they got, but what they did with that. Like, if you notice, not all the Kapoor's are top stars, right? And the ones that aren't already tell you that being, a, being born into that family doesn't guarantee anything, right? It's except what you, run with it, right? That's also, it's important to give credit to that. So I think so, of course, he was known as a chocolate boy and uh, we've seen tons of his and just absolutely delightful films. Of course, he, uh, I mean, his big breakout film after Mera Nam Joker was Bobby. That was the big hit. And it was a very charming film, very popular. I saw it when I was very young. But frankly, uh, this bothered me at the time. And definitely I can say, and this is not judging Raj, uh, not judging Rishi Kapoor at all. But what the film was, I would definitely say very exploitative, especially the cinematography of women, right? Uh, while a lot of his work, frankly, a lot of his work, while ostensibly in the deeply leftist, not osten yeah, le ostensibly in the deeply leftist space, Raj Kapoor's films, a lot of them were in fact written by K.A. Abbas, a lot of them were like card-carrying members of the Communist Party. 
with really powerful and very important empathy for the underdog, for the dispossessed, for the mar for marginalized people. But a lot of the approach of filmmaking and the way he shot heroines, you know, half naked under a waterfall, almost transparent, you know, you could see their nipples popping from their wet saris, just deeply, powerfully exploitative while coexisting. So in a very bizarre mixture, I would say, very, uh, for me, deeply uncomfortable mixture of passionate socialism and deeply felt empathy for the underdog with this shameless exploitation of women, frankly, right? Uh, but that's been, you know, running thread through a, a lot of his work. Uh, and of course, Rishi Kapoor had no part of it, but he was a part of that film, is, which is why I'm mentioning it as a film lover, right? It's, uh, and Rishi Kapoor's career, of course, just totally took off after that. And just delightful films like Amar Akbar Anthony and so many. I mean, that film was insanely lovely. It'll always be an all-time favorite. And also really fun stuff afterwards, you know, Rafu Chakar and Tars and a whole lot of others. Um, but primarily the lover boy was what he excelled at and what had millions of women swooning over him. And of course, uh, Bollywood being what it is, if you make one successful film, you'll get another hundred roles asking you to be more or less the same, uh, which kind of in a way confined his career. But thanks to him, I mean, he, uh, he had, of course, a range of roles, although he was loved as a lover boy, but he did a fantastic bunch of films towards uh, the end of his career as well, especially Mulk, which I particularly admire. Really gutsy to do that. He was, of course, very outspoken anyway, but also very gutsy because it's a film that calls out India's mainstream, deeply passionate oppression and um, disgust and uh, meanness and horrific, horrific repression of the minorities and Muslims in general in many, many, many ways. And he had the guts to call that out. And I mean, I'm glad the, uh, 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 I mean, I've seen, I mean, had the courage to make that film. So Rishi Kapoor, for me, really redeemed everything with that one film alone. And Irfan, of course, is sui generis in a class by himself. So completely the opposite. He was a completely outlier to an outsider to the industry. Um, he came from a fairly wealthy family. Like his mother belonged to some to royalty in uh, Rajasthan. He came from Tonk in Rajasthan. His father was a game hunter who also owned a tire shop. And um, uh, so he was professionally trained at the National School of Drama. He was um, tra trained at a very, very, very fine art. If you see the most beautiful tributes, not only by his zillions of fans everywhere, but his colleagues and his competitors, his co-actors like Nasiruddin Shah, who have written so magnificently. And he said, I'm so unembarrassed to say he was a fine actor, even better than me. I mean, what extraordinary grace of Nasiruddin Shah to say something like that. And he explains why why exactly he says that. It's not like just generosity, but he really deeply felt that. And I think, you know, this also shows such a magnificent industry we have that is so willing to give credit where it's due unabashedly. Uh, it really speaks of generosity we have. But uh, just specifically that Irfan was really a greatly international actor who had a huge international career in addition to his Indian career, which was already very prolific and very accomplished and very prolific. And my friend, uh, uh, Asim Chabra has written a fantastic book on um, Irfan recently that was out a few months ago. Very fine book. I would urge you to read it. Um, and he had like a lot of, like he was international from his first film onwards. Like his first film was Salam Bombay by Mira Nair, which was a hugely international co-production. I think it had money from four or five different countries, from India, from the US, from France, etc. So international from the word go. Uh, both of them, it was a first film, both Mira Nair and um, uh, Irfan. Then, of course, he had a huge body of international work in uh, two Oscar winners, which was including Slumdog Millionaire and Life of Pi, which were both uh, Oscar winning films. And uh, just a huge range of films, including The Warrior and, you know, The Namesake. I mean, exquisite films and a lot of fantastic Indian films from Hassel to Pan Singh Tomar to uh, Life in a Metro to, uh, oh God, zillions of films. I'm terrified I might miss out so many of, you know, if you like one film, you can just say that, but if you love a lot of work, it's hard, including his very recent film, Kareeb Single Single, Kareeb Kareeb Single, just a very charming, very funny film. Um, he had a lot of guts to take very diverse and demanding work, right? So, um, uh, I mean, he was marvelous in Piku, for example, Talwar, my God, that was so fantastic. So just a very rich body work, which we can never forget. So those two people, we will, will always be in our hearts.
I mean, actually, we busted our uh, so time a lot. Yeah, and that, uh, you know, the pile of books at the back is <laughs> just like you are... haven't seen the pile of DVDs, let alone the links hiding in my computer. <laughs> so, if there is ninety nine percent unread work and unseen work, you can imagine how I'm feeling at the end of the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so enjoyed hosting you today, Minakshi. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate the opportunity, and it was delightful talking to you. And thank you very much for all those who attended at very, very short notice. Two thousand apologies for the very short notice, and thank you very much for making time on a Monday morning when everyone should be cooking and cleaning and doing jaru pocha. My God, the most important things of life to make time for this, and especially grateful to Rohan for his. fantastic support very grateful to deepa thank you thank you thank you and uh, you know really want to give you a big hand and a big thank hug you. lots of love and uh, of we will meet again soon thank, thank you bye bye bye, bye. <laughs>